um, special colloquium at the School of Astrophysics. Um, these are special because our semester hasn't fully started. Start? Yeah, it has started. Yeah. So I guess this is not a special colloquium. It's the first colloquium of the semester. Uh, it's uh, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Monami Roy from uh, Ohio State University. Monami is a CCAP fellow there to the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. Um, so Monami did her uh, bachelor's and master's at Calcutta University and then moved to Raman Research Institute in Bengaluru, uh, where she did her PhD with uh, Professor Biman Nath, who has given multiple talks. Well, actually, one talk in, the in this room, but also other talks related to the department. And then after her PhD, uh, Manami moved to uh, Ohio State. And uh, Manami she works on the Saturn Galactic Medium. Um, so when I was a student, till then there was interstellar medium and intergalactic medium. But now we have learned that there is also in between these two, there is also circumgalactic medium. And also just before this came along, the, the CGN came along, we learned that there is also intracluster media. So now there are all these mediums. Um, so essentially, you are talking about, you know, various states of gas that is coming towards the galaxy or going away from the galaxy. And Monami is an expert on that, and she will talk about that. Monami uh, was never a student here, but she has been a sort of a friend of the department for a I long time. She used to come to a She sometimes came to the Colloquia. She uh, wanted to come to the GW school. Right? That's right. That's the first interaction. <laughs> right. And I rejected so. her. <laughs> Being an MSc first year. <laughs> right. So if you are rejected in a conference, remember that you can always come back as a colloquium speaker. <laughs> and, uh, and Ohio State has also been a place where uh, several of our students have gone for PhD, uh, like uh, John Shpiti, who was a BSc student here, who finished in 2015, and also uh, Joy Bhattacharya, who was a BSc and MSc student here, finished in 2020, and, uh, and Ohio State uh, Astronomy has been a great supplier of excellent astronomers who are faculty members uh, all over the world, so we hope that one of you will also become one of them. Hubble Fellows. Uh, yeah, yeah. It turns out that Shamashpiti was the first Hubble Fellow from presidency. Oh, a first Hubble she was not an Hubble Fellow. She, was a, she's a Hubble Fellow now. Now she's a Hubble Fellow. That's what yeah. I'm saying. That the, the first presidential to become a Hubble Fellow is Charles Pippi, and of course, she was to Ohio State. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so with, without further delay, let's uh, hear from one of Thank you, Artika, for the introduction, and thank you, Artika and ma'am for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak thank here. <laughs> and so, today, I will be talking about uh, the complex temperature structure of galactic halo or atmosphere. Uh, so before uh, starting about like what is galactic halo or atmosphere, let's first talk about what is galaxy. So when we think of a galaxy or imagine a galaxy, we think of a picture something like this. <clears throat> so what this is, is a collection of billion or trillions of stars and uh, in between stars, the medium is filled with uh, dust and gas. And as you can see, the dust is uh, gray ring around the spiral arm. So this is a spiral galaxy. And uh, you can say that from uh, the spiral structure of this galaxy. But introducing a galaxy uh, by a single picture is kind of introducing, like telling someone what a cat is with a single breed, which cannot possibly describe the wide variety of cat breed we have in our universe. <laughs> so in that regard, this recent JWST picture, which is one of my favorite astronomy picture, actually reveals the wide range of galaxies in a single uh, patch of sky. So the, this patch of sky is this small square, which is 
so small with respect to the angular resolution in the sky with respect to the moon you can see that and in this small patch of sky you can see this many of galaxies does anybody like this all of these uh, dots are actually the galaxies except for i think three of them they are basically stars so does anybody want to take a guess that how many galaxies are there in this small patch of sky 10 billion uh, you mean visible or oh, visible. actual actual visible that's less than a million tens of thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of 5500 basically according to the nasa website so yeah a lot of galaxies so and you can see the variety of this galaxy there is like a spiral galaxy this galaxy and there are also difference of colors uh, like blue red as you can see by eyes and uh, so there can be many categories uh, by which we can divide uh, this galaxies into different like categories so one of the categories which astronomers keeps coming back to is the blue and red galaxy so blue blue galaxies the galaxies which are still forming stars and the red galaxies are the galaxies which is like stop forming stars they are basically quasar galaxies and star formation is a very important process in the galaxy because it's a lifeline of the galaxy and uh, it actually is a prime driver of the evolution of a galaxy but if we count all the gas in this disk of the galaxy then we can see that galaxies don't have enough gas in their disk to continue or sustain star formation for a long period of time so for example if you think about our own milky way so if you like put a typical gas mass of the milky way disk which is kind of 10 to the power 10 solar mass and typical star formation rate in the milky way which is like 2 to 3 solar mass per year roughly so you can calculate the quill depletion time scale quill is the whole gas which basically the star formation quill to the galaxy then you can calculate this time scale to be like 3 giga year and we know for milky way milky way is forming star more than 3 giga year i mean much more than 3 giga year so where this gas is coming from i mean there is some other place galaxies are getting their gas supply or the fuel supply so for answering that question i need to admit that i was misleading you about what actually a galaxy is so what picture i was showing you is the visible part of the galaxy because that is there where the stars are and they are emitting light so we can see it we can show pretty pictures of it but actual size of the galaxy is somewhere much bigger like 20 times much bigger than the galactic disk so the actual size of the galaxy is typically the virial radius of a halo which is for milky way is 200 kiloparsec which is 20 times more than the milky way disk and in this region in the shaded region in the spherical region around this galaxy is basically contains uh, invisible dark matter which is literally invisible and there, there is invisible gas in quotes because these gas are very diffuse so diffuse means basically the density is less than 10 to the power minus 1 to 10 to the power minus 5 particle per cc which is like 1 trillion and trillion times less dense than the air we breathe in so because of this diffuseness if we point a telescope towards this kind of gas this we won't see anything because this gas would not emit enough light at the sensitivity we can detect by our current telescopes so that's why it's basically invisible to us but if we can't see something directly that does not mean we can't see things indirectly so this is a uh, example of how we can see the direct and indirect observation so in this figure you can see children are playing in the tent and we can observe that there are three children which is playing in the tent this is the direct observation but in this picture you are actually seeing some shadows of children basically there is a background light which are casting shadow in the tent and you can infer a lot about a uh, lot about this tent uh, 
from this shadow information, like there are like four children and they have like a similar kind of age and they are playing something and so on. So casting shadow has a very powerful tool when we can't actually make a direct observation. So that's a basic principle behind the absorption line spectroscopy. Basically, there is a bright source in the background, which can be quasar, which can be any stars. And because for quasar and different stars, we know the spectra very well. And when that light from this bright source goes through any intervening medium, in this case, especially the circumgalactic medium of a galaxy, it suffers absorption from the metals and ions which lives in the circumgalactic medium. And by looking at their spectra and their absorption features and which are the lines they have, we can actually infer about what is the temperature, density, structure of this circumgalactic medium. So basically, these are different ions, and this is basically temperature and density plot. And you can see particular different ions have different phasic temperature and density. So basically, if we see OH in a quasar spectra, which is passing through I and mean, through a certain galactic medium of a galaxy, then we can say that, okay, that particular line of sight has a gas, which is kind of temperature like 6.5 and density is 10 to the power minus 6. If we assume the gas is in collisionally equilibrium. Uh, so, and as you can see, most of the lines are... Okay. Uh, just one question. So, how do you know that this absorption line is not from the material inside the quasar? And I think the quasar, what I understand is like the quasar lines would be pretty strong in comparison to the uh, circumgalactic medium line. So they are basically broad emission line or like broad absorption so line. What I'm thinking is that maybe there are some typical lines mm -hmm. which uh, we do not expect in, uh, quasar. in a quasar. Mm -hmm. uh, in absorption medium inside the quasar, and we expect in the, the CGM. So, yeah. so are there uh, lines like that? I mean, I mean, there are some low ions lines also we can detect it, like MG4, MG2. I don't, I'm, I, 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 I think that those are not detected in a quasar spectra. I also, think. the red red shift shift is the red shift is the main measure. Mm -hmm. And I think lines were also like very broad in case of quasar. Yeah, quasar yeah. quasi absorption lines can be broad or narrow okay, okay. because depending whether it's in the outflow or not. But the red shift. Right. Red shift. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so for uh, this kind of uh, detection of this line, we actually need UV and extra observation. And from ground, it is re really difficult to observe this UV and X-ray. So we need to go to the space uh, to observe this various amount of lines. And these all of the lines are actually detected in the CGM in some cases. So thanks to the uh, cos hello spectrograph on board Hubble Space Telescope, we can see this lot of different ions uh, in the CGM of Milky Way and even the external galaxies. And by looking at those absorption spectra of different ions with a uh, variety of ionization potential, we can actually uh, infer that the CGM is not a calm place. Basically, we think because it's a diffuse gas, you might think that it is a very calm place. There is nothing much going on because it's very diffuse. But CGM is not a calm place. There are continuously outflow, inflow, recycling of gas, even accretion of gas from the intergalactic media. Everything is going on inside the CGM. And the CGM is continuously talking with the galactic disk, also with the intergalactic medium and whatnot. So there is a messy things going on inside the CGM. And basically, uh, coming back to my previous question, that where galaxy actually obtain this fuel for the star formation, actually CGM is actually giving this fuel for the star formation in terms of inflow of gas, recycling of gas, and they are actually continuously replenish the galaxy's fuel supply because there is continuous talking happening in uh, between the galactic disk and the circle galactic medium. So basically, CGM plays a very important role in sustaining the star formation of a galaxy, and hence it actually 
plays an important role in the evolution of the galaxy. And that is why we should really care about this circumgalactic medium or CGM. Now, by observation of different ions, we actually uh, can tell that there are different phases in the CGM. Like CGM is multi-phase because the temperature and density has a wide range because we see this wide range of ions. And there are three distinct phases we can say, which is one is hot phase, which has roughly the temperature of the medial uh, temperature of the uh, halo. And what, second is warm phase, which has less than the power five to six Kelvin. And another is the cool phase, which has roughly like less than 10 to the power 4.5 K. So there is another problem in the galaxy evolution. So basically, if we count, uh, and, and if we know a uh, galaxy's uh, halo mass and dark matter halo mass, we kind of, from the lambda cdn model, we can actually can make a theoretical prediction that, okay, we would expect this fraction of variance in a galaxy. But if we count only the this portion of the galaxy and all the variance like stars and uh, gas, but we can only take into a, uh, we can only consider like 30% of the baryonic fraction which we explained. So till now basically, I mean, before we could, I mean, know that there is a CGM as R.C. Sarah has said that, but I mean, we we were thinking that it, it was very puzzling that what is happening here, where is that this rest 80% of the baryons. But with the detection of the CGM and with different phases, we can see that this barrier and missing barrier problems is like going to be solved very soon because I think a lot of these variants are residing in the hill and with the better observational facilities of the CGM in future, we actually can decrease this error bar significantly. Uh, what are the solid portions and the shaded? Ah, so solid is the measurement actually and this is the error bar. Oh. And there is also a new addition of the CGM, gas or phase, which is super radial CGM, which has the temperature, the gas has the temperature, a lot more than the radial temperature of the galaxy, which is also very puzzling because from the galaxy evolution theory, we would expect that, okay, the gas can have a maximum temperature of the radial temperature, but we can see a lot of this pipelines as the super radial CGM. And and this has been detected by actually Sanskriti Das, the alumni of uh, presidency. So, yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, on a me, uh, oh, point one says so that's the very odd fraction you are mm -hmm. thinking, 17 percent of the kilo. Yeah. Now, how are this gas we know, but how do you detect all this cool CGM, warm hot CGM? From, CGM. from different ions, basically. So it's about it's 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 no, some well, some is UV also. Yeah, UV also, yeah, yeah. So the temperature is of course extra the more yeah. and more. Yeah. yeah. And this is for <laughs> which gas? I mean, this is uh, this is for Milky Way. This is for okay. Yeah, mass is also electricity. And we can do this precise measurement only, I think, in Milky Way really? because there are lots of side lines available. For external galaxies, it's very difficult. And uh, so today in my talk, I would be talking about these two components. I will not talk about these two components much. So the cool CGM, because it's very important in star formation, uh, fuel uh, for the galaxy, and super radial CGM, because it's very, like, uh, something which is very puzzling for theories that why the super medial gas is coming. And for cool CGM, you can also see that 40% of the barium budget is like, other than all the things, this is the maximum barium budget, which is actually, uh, yeah. So, so that's why it's very important phase among all the other phases of the CGM. So let's first talk about this cool phase. So by cool gas, I mean, because different uh, like, field has different definition of this cold gas. So cold gas means, I mean, the temp which has temperature, which is less than 10 to the power 4.5 K, roughly. So uh, what we see in the cosmological simulation, so the uh, upper panel is the cosmological simulation. We can see there is, this, this, this is basically a temperature uh, profile of a uh, simulated galaxy, a uh, Milky Way type simulated galaxy. And you can see there is a lot of cold gas 
out there in the CGM. CGM is basically in this outer region. And you can see there is a lot of cold gas there in the cosmological simulation, what, which we also expect from the observation. Whereas, uh, we in idealized simulation, which is this bottom panel, you can see that there is a vacuum spot. There is not much cold gas there in the idealized simulation. Okay. One is cosmological and another is idealized. In one is of just a galaxy, high resolution galaxy simulation. Single, single, single galaxy. galaxy. Yes, single. And the upper one is the cosmological. cosmological sensory optic one. one zoom in simulation, let's say. Yes. So, so what is happening here? What is the missing link between this cosmological simulation and idealized simulation? So, typically idealized simulation actually captures only the galaxy and the red points are actually which idealized simulation captures in their like runs, which is outflow in flow recycling and anything which happens within a galaxy because it's a box, closed box. But uh, in cosmological simulation, with uh, all of these processes, cosmological simulation actually takes into account two more processes. One is accretion from intergalactic medium, and another is accretion from satellite galaxy, because cosmological simulation allows a galaxy to interact with the outside world. So that's why there is like accretion from intergalactic medium and satellite galaxy, which is allowed in cosmological simulation, which is not allowed in idealized simulation. So today I would be talking about only the satellite galaxy accretion and, um, and, and in the light of the idealized simulation, we would put the satellite galaxy in the idealized simulation and see how much cold gas can be coming from the satellite galaxy in the outer CGM and can it like satisfy something like a cosmological simulation we can basically replicate or not. And you can ask me why we can't do it in cosmological simulation because for cosmological simulation we can't actually go to very small scale because of the resolution problem. So idealized simulation is always better to study the physical processes which involve very small scale because cooling is a small scale problem. So that's why we need to go to the idealized simulation. So now this is our simulation setup where simulation code we use is Gizmo and this is the isolated galaxy simulation as I mentioned and this use the fire to uh, feedback mechanism. So where our initial condition is we have a Milky Way type dark matter halo of the host and the host has black hole, stellar bulge, stellar disk, gaseous disk, dark matter halo and also the CGM or set of galaxy medium and there are Three setup of satellite galaxy. One is two 10 to the power 10 solar mass satellites, which is kind of our Milky Way and LMC SMC. And because we want to keep this total mass of the satellite same, we have two another two other setups where like 20 10 to the power 9 solar mass satellites and 200 10 to the power 8 solar mass satellites. Uh, so these are three setups we would be talking about today. And the satellites also have all the components like hosts except for the CGM. So, so this is our setup. So, if I play the movie, this is basically two 10 to the power 10 solar mass satellites uh, orbiting around a Milky Way like host, and one is closer to the this 50 kiloparsec, and other, another is at like 100 kiloparsec. And you can see the closer to the disk one is actually getting rid of their gas very quickly, but whereas the outer satellite is actually removing their gas like later than the uh, nearer one. And uh, and at some at this simulation snapshot, actually, this all all two of them actually get rid of their gases uh, to the galaxy. In 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 what kind of time span? It's kind of four different times. Four different. Yeah. And the other question I had is that what kind of in, in just a gravity or you you add additional interaction? I mean, because you have a Milky Way galaxy, right? And then you have two idealized satellites, so yes. mass ten to the ten yes. scale of mass. Yes. So what is the interaction, just gravitational or do you add anything? The to gravitational it? and like, I think for the satellite and the host interaction is gravitational and also the cooling and mixing layer thing is also for the gas. gas. Yes. For the gas. Yes. So yes. They but the dark matter is only that. So that is definitely yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So because I was just wondering that yeah. how you include 
the dynamicity is the problem. Okay, wait. Mm -hmm. What, what, the, in the, yeah, the, <laughs> what is the color screen? Okay, the color screen is actually the temperature. Uh, and this is just basically if sat, we have divided it like 0 to 1. So basically the satellite gas is like 1 and the host gas is actually 0. So if you see this turquoise color, if I'm not wrong, it's like a yeah. So this color is actually the host color. And you can see if, let's say, like reddish color or pinkish color, which is basically the satellite gas. So because it's a particle like it's pH 4 so we have like separate uh, like host particles and satellite particles. So we can actually distinguish between which we, which is we call satellite and which is we call host. And what is the particle with the mass resolution? Uh, 10 to the power 4 and we have, yeah. yeah. We have like... What's happening in the disk when the satellites are sort of accreting? Yeah. The disk, there is a bright turquoise thing that is continuously sloshing around. What yeah, so and this is the one, right? right. This outflow going on. Like the disk has all the outflow in fluid cycling. Everything is, I mean, both galaxy has every physical process which can be possible, like outflow, inflow, even the recycling of gas, etc. And we also, I mean, I mean, I think to answer your question, we also check that if it uh, significantly increase uh, the star formation rate of the galaxy, it uh, does not basically those cold gas are actually falling, but not increasing the star formation rate of the host galaxy significantly. Like they are remaining like Milky Way type star formation. And so this is another setup with like 20, 10 to the power 9 solar mass satellite. And I think the difference between the previous movie and this movie is actually these satellites are getting rid of their gas pretty fast because they are small satellites and they are actually their gravitational pull is uh, lower gravitation potential is lower they fall much faster much, much the faster to the gravitation level exactly and this is a messy picture so basically 200 to the power 8 where basically they are getting rid of the gas pretty quickly like within a fraction of our so let's see what is happening around the satellites. Let's zoom into the region around the satellite to see what exactly the physical process is happening. And this is where the idealized simulation is uh, becoming useful because we can zoom into a particular region and we can see that what microprocessor is happening, like cooling and what not. So there are like several uh, processes can happen. So this is a zoom in uh, version of the uh, region around the satellite. And this is like the center of the satellite. It's six and k radius of the satellite. So I denote that satellite gas is this by this triangle, and the host gas is by circle. And if it's a cold gas, it's a blue gas, and if it's a hot gas, it's a red gas. So, so first thing which can happen is the ramp pressure stripping when basically satellite moves through any medium. Here it's like you know, the circumgalactic medium of the host galaxy. It feels a pressure, and that pressure can actually if that pressure dominates the gravitational pull of the galaxy, satellite galaxy, then it can actually strip the gas from the satellites. And that can actually be uh, mixed into the host galaxy. So as you can see, the gas can be ramp pressure stripped, but not only the ramp pressure stripped gas, there can be uh, induced cooling in the host halo by the satellite. And how it is so, so basically this stripped cold gas will try to mix with the hot CGM. So the stripped cold gas is roughly of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, and the hot CGM has the temperature of 10 to the power 6 Kelvin. So if they mix together, it, it will have a temperature of 10 to the power 5 Kelvin, and that is the temperature where cooling rate is very high. And so basically that mixing layer will cool very fast. So in the mixing layer, there can be a lot of cooling. And another thing can be there, is turbulence driven cooling when the satellite will move through the CGM, it can actually stir the medium like we stir like coffee with a spoon. So basically, satellite will also stir the circumgalactic medium of the host galaxy, and it can create some local instability, which can actually uh, induce some cooling because we'll have a dense gas and density induces more cooling. And then there can be another possibility where host gas can fall into the satellite potential and pull it uh, because of falling into the satellite potential because satellite potential is smaller than the host potential. 
So, and we can capture all of these in our simulation, as you can see by this color code. This is our satellite galaxy setup, where this is satellite galaxy. And behind this, there is this cool strip gas, you can see from the color bar. And this region is basically around the cool strip gas. You can see some induced cool gas, which is coinciding with this cool strip gas, that means they are coming from the mixing layer group and they are always there, like this kind of thing is always there in the simulation throughout the, like a 4 giga year time scale. So this is a qualitative picture, let's uh, talk about these things in terms of numbers, like let's say that what is the strip cool gas mass over time? So this is the three setups I had described and so what is the take? point from this uh, plot where it's basically the strip gas for this three of the plots the one common thing is strip gas increase over time and they reach a peak and then decrease basically but the massive ones which is the blue ones of 10 to the power 10 solar mass they actually uh, continues to feed this cooled gas to the CGM till 4 giga year even maybe beyond that if we explain the simulation but the less massive one, like let's say for 10 to the per H one, the green one, they are getting rid of their gas or stripped very faster, like within one or 1.5 giga year. So what is happening to this uh, cool strip gas? Are they like falling into the post ISM as we had seen in the movie clearly, or they're getting mixed with the hot gas of the host CGM? So let's see what is happening. Like we can see by in the movie that they're falling into the host ISM, but they are, are they getting mixed with hot gas of the host CGM? Let's see that. So, so this is like left hand side is this two satellites of the plus ten solar mass, where you can see. So this is the PTF of stripped coal gas temperature evolution over time. So basically, once this coal gas is getting stripped, what is the temperature evolution? So are they remaining cold or they are getting hot? And this is in the entire four giga. Yeah, entire. This is time integrated. So you just keep up, you just keep keep track of the temperature of the gas. Exactly. Point of. Exactly. After they get stripped and they're cold, basically. And as you can see, for this uh, ten to the power ten solar mass satellite, the most of the gases are actually retaining their temperature. They're get, they're remaining cool. And you can see it from the CDF distribution as well. Like sixty percent of the uh, ten to the power four gas is keeping their temperature. Whereas for 20 satellites of 10 to the power 9, you can see the bump is getting shorter and this is getting higher and which we can see from the uh, CDF as well, like 30% of the gas is retaining their temperature other than that all of them are getting mixed and heated up. But for the 10 to the power 8, the change is drastically that like all of them I think are getting uh, hot very fast. And you can see also clearly from the CDF that this number is very small. So what is happening here? Why these bigger satellites are uh, keeping their gas cold for a longer period of time, but whereas this 10 to the power 8 solar mass are not being able to do that? Because this 10 to the power 10 solar mass satellites will produce large clouds, which um, because it's a large cloud, so cloud crushing time will depend on the cloud radius. So if it's a large cloud, cloud crushing time would be larger. So it will remain, uh, it will like, it takes some time to destroy or mix this cold clouds with the hot CGM. So they will retain their temperature. Whereas this 10 to the power eight solar mass satellites will produce small clouds, which get easily mixed up because their cloud crushing time is very small and they are easy to be crushed or mixed with the hot CGM. And we had checked this cloud uh, size also, and we confirmed that actually 10 to the power 10 solar mass satellites are producing large clouds, and 10 to the power 8 solar mass satellites are producing small clouds. Now, let's talk about what happens to the induced cool gas mass. So, as you can see, this is the total induced cool gas mass uh, in the CGM by the satellites. As you can see, that this Induced cool gas mass is typically in the same order of magnitude as the strict cold gas mass. So that the take home point for from these two plots are actually that satellites not only supply cold gas to the CGM of a host galaxy by stripping, but it actually give 
to like the CGM, the same amount of cold gas by inducing more cooling into the CGM of the host galaxy. So there is like equal amount of contribution coming from stripping and also the induced cooling. And from these two points, so this is the total induced cool gas mass and this is the gas induced cool outside of the satellite, not inside of the satellite. So that means you can see that there is no such difference. I mean, they're more and um, more or less same. So most induced cooling is happening outside of the satellite. So basically the third possibility I said that uh, host gas can fall inside the satellite potential and get cool. That possibility is somehow it's not it's not. dominated. Yeah. Yeah. So, and from this two, you can see that the shape of these two curves are almost equal with some delay. And as you remember, the movie also showed that all of these induced cool gas are actually coinciding with the stripped cold gas mass. So, and, and as we can see from this, the outside satellite induced cool gas mass is also like the same. So basically, this concludes that most of this induced cooling is coming from the mixing layer because there is like the strip gas which tries to mix with the hot CGA and in the mixing layer there is a similar amount of induced cooling happening in the CGM of the host galaxy. Now the question is what about cosmic rays? If we put cosmic rays in that simulation box because everybody asks this question that if there is any simulation they will ask what about cosmic rays? What about magnetic field? So we already had magnetic field using those simulations. But let's put cosmic rays into the simulation and see what is happening. So, and why cosmic rays, you can ask, because cosmic rays have a pressure and it can actually support this cold phase with uh, extra pressure support. So cold, uh, cold phase is supported by thermal pressure support as we thought with the hot CGM because we know they are coexisting, so P hot should be equal to the P cold. So, but this cosmic ray can actually support this cold gas against this hot gas, and that can make some differences. So, let's see what can the differences. So, basically, in this movie, uh, in this simulation by Barsky et al., you can see this is the no CR and this is the high cosmic ray phase. So, PC is the cosmic ray, PG is the gas. So, these are the high cosmic ray runs, and as you can see. These actually produce a small amount of clouds, small uh, sizes of clouds, but these cloud sizes are much bigger as you increase the cosmic ray pressure. And because the reason behind this is basically cosmic ray pressure is supporting this cold cloud, so it can be bigger and it can be less dense as well because we don't need to actually apply this pressure, uh, thermal pressure equilibrium. We have a non thermal pressure component. So, and we can see this similar kind of thing in our uh, cosmic, no cosmic ray, high cosmic ray simulation, where high cosmic ray mean. So, I'll stop this movie in a particular snapshot, maybe. So, this snapshot. So, you can see these are roughly an equal snapshot. We are already, for the no cosmic ray setup, the clouds actually started to like uh, break down and they are basically small, small clouds. But in this, High cosmic ray simulation, which is like the clouds are actually very bigger and they're like long tail and they are kind of retaining their structure. They're not, they're actually a coherent structure forming behind the satellites. So the cloud sizes are actually bigger. And we have checked that these cloud sizes are actually cloud densities are also like little less. So basically, cosmic ray can actually support this cold cloud and give rise to this coherent uh, big structure behind the satellites. And that actually induces more cooling because it actually uh, offers more surface area for the mixing layer cooling. There are also the color for the temperature, right? Yeah, 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 it's a temperature. And uh, basically, the red is the strip satellite gas and the blue is the host gas. So, as you can see, yeah, that is gas is triangle, right? Yeah, triangle. triangle. Triangle and blue is like triangle you can't like to see here, yeah, but, uh, but but you see there is a plus sign saying black hole. So you have a black hole also. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The black hole is there, but we are not like feeding the black hole. There is no black hole feedback, black but hole the black hole is there. Is Okay. But I just plotted it because just to, I mean, uh, notice that where the satellite is going because the gas are getting stripped after that. That's just a sink particle sitting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just sink particle sitting there. Yeah. So in this case, what is the uh, 
So pressure ratio is uh, we started from a EQ partition in energy density, which we see in the ISM. So basically the pressure ratio is like 0. 0.5. So PC by PG is 0. 0.5. Which is not like crazy to assume because as you saw in the uh, the previous idealized simulation, they had also assumed like PC by PG is equal to like 10 or 100. So and we see kind of in ISM this PC by PG, I mean EC by PG, energy density of cosmic ray and thermal pressure energy density is kind of in a EQ partition. So it can be possible in the CG math with what I want to say. In the host gases, uh, some of the host gases is uh, you know, 150 kiloparsec away from the center because of the outflow or uh, because of the because of the So you are talking about this gas? No, that is at zero, right? Yeah, but there is host... the ISM basically. And this, this is the host gas, basically, this is the mixing layer cooling. So mixing layer is happening in host gas, right? No, but why is host gas there? Because uh, there is stripped gas there. And around the stripped mixing layer, there is this host induced host gas. Yes, uh, and oh. there is not other host gas in the CG mm -hmm. in between this. Thing. Because that was the ideal simulation had that problem that in the 100, 150 uh, kiloparsec region, there is no induced cooling, like precipitation kind of thing can, can't happen because there is not enough density. So why we are seeing such cold gas in the, out there in the CG? So that host gas is coming from the satellite strip gas because satellite strip gas is trying to mix with the hot CG. So they are not coming from here because outflow can't reach any one. But then why are we calling it host gas? Because uh, I mean, yes, I think that yeah. Means. So nomenclature is host gas because satellite inducing the cooling into the host gas. Not I mean, satellite gas is inducing cooling. The satellite gas is trying to mix with the host gas, and that's how it is getting cooled. So that's, so that's the so so. If I understand correctly, correct me if I wrong. So that is the warm gas or uh, higher temperature gas in the host gas is the satellite induced cooling in that and that is making the whole host gas cool down. Exactly. That's why it's yeah. called the host yes, gas. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's not at all like the cold gas yeah. is going from, from, the, yeah. from the outflow. And that was a problem in the idealized simulation that we can't see those gas in the because now outflow can use and give the satellite interactors. Yeah. That's what is Possible in making the this CGM cooler. Exactly. Cooler. exactly. Why do you call host gas cold gas? And I mean that you could have just I mean one could have named it cold gas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then uh, there is satellite cold gas yeah. as well and host there cold gas as well. Like so there is like you need to have a difference. So and because it's a speech code, we know what are the host particles, what are the satellite particles, so kind of. And we can see this similar uh, structure difference in no CR and high CR case in the smaller satellites as well. And that will be more useful for the smaller satellites because smaller satellites, as you can see here, it is actually getting like cloud is destro destroyed or mixed very easily. But here, this coherent structure is forming because of this high cosmic ray thing, and they are directly falling basically into the galaxy. So now let's. Uh, briefly talk about the super medial gas, uh, which by super medial gas I mean basically the temp which has the gas with a temperature greater than 6 centigrade or 6k and which is the Milky Way has a medial temperature of 2 times 10 to the power 6k. So this is pretty high temperature. So there has been a lot of detection of this super medial gas phase in recent times. Uh, I mean the first detection was by Sound City and then there is other detection. So in emission and absorption, uh, both of the cases, there is in different side lines, quasar side lines, you could see this super medial gas phase. And not only uh, along the particular line of sites, you can see it in all sky maps like Halosat or like Erosita. So this is a Halosat map where you can see basically both of the components. This is like the hot components, the super medial components. So why is it called super medial? Why the because the medial temperature is 10 to the power 2 into 10 to the power 6k and it is like more than 6 times 10 to the power 6k. So even like 10 to the power 7k as well. <laughs> so that's a super medial. <laughs> and it's very confusing because uh, previously the medial gas was 
called hot gas. Now it is called hot gas, and diesel gas is called warm hot gas. Yeah, it's no, no, no. <laughs> very confusing here. <laughs> so, uh, what we di uh, did here, uh, to because we could see in this quasar spectra. So these are the extra galaxy uh, uh, side lines in the Milky Way, and these are the quasar side lines basically. And in this extra galaxy side lines. We could see these detections uh, in various sites during the super detailed phase because those ions have a very high ionization potential, and we can say something about the temperature of the gas from those high ions. So, but absorption and spectroscopy is cool, but we can't say anything about the position of the gas where it is coming from, and like because we are integrated over a line of sight, so it can be. In the disk of the galaxy, it can be in the extraplanar region, it can be there in the CGM. So we don't know where the super detailed gas is because we can see it in the all the line of sight, but we can't. We this is not possible to know from this uh, quasar. Uh, sorry, sorry, but I have little confusing. Says twenty eight X R D. That is X R binary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the quasars. The red points are the quasars. I will come to the X R D part. Okay. Uh, so the quasar part has been done by the Sanskriti. Uh, so she has like detected uh, the super medial phase in most of the side lines, but we don't know the, that's what I was telling that we don't know what is the location of the super medial gas. So that's why uh, we are oh. currently doing something with the XRBs where basically we are trying to uh, find those particular ions uh, in the spectra of XRB. So if we find these particular ions in the spectra of XRBs, then we can say that it is coming from the yeah. XRB and in between medium. So yeah. us and in between mediums, so it is coming from the ISF. Uh, and for XRB, if we are seeing a line from XRB, that would be pretty broad line. So that would be not be like a narrow line. So if we see a narrow kind of uh, high ion line, uh, then we can infer from that that this is coming from ISF. So we can rule out the CGM theory that, okay, the gas is not in the CGM, it is in the ISM. So that's why we took like 28 XRBs from the Chandra archives. Uh, so, and uh, this is our result. So we have like 28 into four, like 112 observations because each observation has different exposure mode and two gettings. So basically there are 112 observations and among them, 16 of them showed a three sigma detection in those ions which are looking for like neon 10, silicon 14, and sulfur 16. And I mean, a lot of them, I don't know, it's very not very clear here. So this part, there are some like bold, uh, bold uh, numbers. Those are the detections, basically, three sigma detection. And in this part, this detections from signals X1 and I think GX13 plus one, those are mainly coming from XRB's intrinsic spectra because basically they are very they are fitted by a broad Gaussian line uh, in this NEX or silicon 14 or sulfur uh, 16. So they are not the intervening media. They are not coming from the intervening media. We can rule out the possibility because these three or four is like, yeah, there is just some predictions, but most of them are not showing any particular evidence that it is coming from the ISM. So we can basically rule out the ISM idea that it's not coming from the ISM. So, so these gases are either like in extraplanar region or in the outer CGM. So now how to do that? Now, I, I, I don't know if there is any observational technique to distinguish between extraplanar and the outer CGM. So then we again- I'm sorry, I just want to, this is a distraction. Mm -hmm. Can you just share your slides in Zoom? Because that was not done. It doesn't matter. From now on, you can share. You oh. just put your slides. Oh. And I also didn't, I was just looking at the top. And the oh, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> hmm. So we just only have the audio recording. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, so, so we actually take uh, like help of the simulation again uh, to like distinguish between that it is an extraplanar gas or in the outer CGM. 
And obviously, if any of you can think of any cool observational technique uh, that can actually distinguish between these two, then please let me know. <laughs> I would be very much interested. So in the simulation, the uh, same simulation using like gizmo, uh, uh, we actually done a temperature map of uh, temperature radio profile at like 0.5 giga year or 1 giga year. So it is just a 0.5 giga year thing. And we can see there is a lot of this uh, 10 to the power 7 K gas we can see here. I mean, not a lot in comparison to the other phases, but there are some gases uh, there in the uh, 10, less than 20 kilowatts reach here. Super giga gas. And uh, we can show over time also. This is a, for the one snapshot, but this is like over the entire like simulation box, like till 1.5 giga year, we had seen that there is a, a continuous supply of the super video gas within this 20 kiloparsec region. And this is like basically we had tested like four different runs. So one with uh, normal uh, uh, idealized galaxy simulation, and then we, for one case, we had actually turn off the feedback feedback of the galaxy and one case we have a low cosmic ray and one case we have a high cosmic ray to see that if the feedback is generating this gas or if the cosmic ray is heating up this gas. And we can see in all of these cases there is super video gas even in the low feedback cases surprisingly because everybody thought that it is from the feedback because it's a feedback can heat up that gas and give rise to this. But that's uh... Within 20 kilobars. Yes, within 20 that kilobars. The, within the optical region of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. That's not uh, outside of the... No, galaxy. so that's our conclusion that, okay, it's not coming, at least from this simulation, uh, we are seeing that it's not coming from the CGM, it's coming from the extraplanar region. So that's our conclusion from this simulation. But uh, obviously we need to look into much more like simulation, like because every simulation has different feedback mechanism, different cooling procedure and everything like that. So we need to like uh, study the about leading it. understanding that uh, why what would be the most probable reason, reason for having a super radium gas. Yes. With feedback at outer radius. With feedback at outer radius, there is no uh, the super radial gas. There's no, 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 no. There is no super radial gas. Not in, you mean not in your idealized Not in the idealized simulation box, yeah. But yeah, we need to look into the cosmological simulation and other simulations also, like have a consensus picture. But yeah, for now, in this idealized box, there and is your, no. Your, uh, here, your uh, feedback is like uh, our galaxy. Feedback. Yes. It's not very really heavy feedback. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we are detecting this gas in the Milky Way, so basically we need to test it for a Milky Way kind of setup. How do you model your feedback there? You just it's kind of a stellar feedback. Yeah, that's yeah. not an ADN feedback. So for ADN feedback, I think we would see a lot of more uh, super high temperature. Sorry, I can't find the mouse. That's why I could not do it. <laughs> Okay, me too. I, I, I think now you need to go there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. So, if I can't like a little bit, no, it's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's wrap up. No, no, that's fine. So, yeah, so what is actually happening? Uh, why why the super real gas is there in at least in this simulation? So, so we basically tracked uh, the gas which we found uh, super real at one giga year till like their past evolution, like since, since like zero, the start of the simulation. So this is where it becomes super real and we are actually following that gas in the past. So till zero. So as you can see at zero, it was a real gas and then it is slowly heating up, and then at 0.9 giga year, it is actually getting a spike uh, and going over a super radial. And after that, also we had tracked it, and you can see that this, I mean, focus on the blue line now, for now, so it is actually dropping immediately. Now, even in the density, you can see the similar thing, basically increasing and then a sudden spike. 
So, and then the radius is basically the position of this gas. So, it is basically in falling from like 50 kiloparsec region and falling into like a 10 kiloparsec or 20 kiloparsec region of the galaxy. So, what is happening here? What we think is happening here is the infalling gas actually, uh, when they are infalling, they are basically losing their gravitational energy and that is getting transferred into the thermal energy. So, they are slowly, slowly heated up. And at this point, what is happening, they are converting their spherical flow from a disk geometry. So, basically, they are coming here from at this position and then they are basically getting suppressed into a sandwich-like structure. So, basically, spherical geometry transforms into a disk geometry, which makes this gas compressed and there would be a compression heating would be there. And that's why we are seeing this spike in the temperature. So, what's happening? Very discontinuous uh, thing. Uh, I mean, like a discontinuous. Yeah, discontinuous because it's just like before joining, like the spherical flow is converting into this uh, kind of flow. And then basically immediately because it is kind of, they are near the disk and before joining the disk, they're even eventually cool down because those energies are basically rotationally sub uh, with transform into the rotation support of the gas and they're cooled down and they're basically going to the ISF and that's it. But how can this uh, move than the gravitational energy? Uh, so, pre I mean, the previous it is actually falling and then it is losing the gravitational energy and they are heating up slowly. So, this slow so, so increase in the uh, thing is for the gravitational energy, which actually increases the temperature of gas by a factor of two or so. And which is, uh, I mean, if we do the yeah. R by R calculation, we can actually see that this amount of that this much of the temperature can be rise from the losing of the gravitational uh, energy but the sudden spike to the uh, super to the super medial is because of the spherical geometry is converted into this geometry and that's how it is actually compressed and for the compression it is heated up but the compression is by the gravitational effect or by something. by the geometry effect kind of because it's a spherical geometry and then it is getting like compressed so a spherical flow is compressed into a let's say a ball is compressed into a kind of point do you have non-zero angular momentum yeah, yeah that's what you have. have yeah so that that is angular momentum and that you no, because if angular momentum is present it's, it will naturally get uh, transform into some like this type structure. Yeah, yeah, that's it's happening. So for the angular uh, momentum, so there, this structure is happening, and then basically before, even like after this, it is becoming a rotational supported disk, and that's why the temperature is going down immediately. But then you can ask the question that why then we are seeing because this gas is immediately cooled down right after getting heated up. But then why we are seeing the continuous. Uh, uh, line of super medial mass basically in the previous plot because there is continuously infall happening and I mean continuously this process is happening over the time so there is always this kind of process happening and even if the one set of gas is cooled down immediately other set of gas is falling and doing this and I agree this is very small amount of gas doing this stuff and we also agree that super medial gas is even from the observation, you also see the super real gas does not dominate the valiant budget. But what we, and we are also seeing that similar thing, as you remember from even the previous plot, this is a very small amount of gas compared to the other phase of the gas. But it could be the physical time scale for a gas to remain in the super real phase. It's very like, I mean, <coughs> You can see it's immediately dropped down. I mean, it's then I will say that it is very difficult to detect as well. But it the is always there, there, right? I think the idea, what she's trying to say is that a patch of gas might be staying in a super medial phase immediately. Yeah. But you will always have no infall all the time. And so that is a different phase. But even in a line of sight. But you can always detect, right? I mean, if there is a, always a supply, then always, I mean, there is a possibility that there is a line of sight passing and that patch of gas. Yeah, and this so much small time scale, that might also be related to the numeric scenario. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, but this is very small time scale, then it's very difficult to catch that. Yeah, unless you have a continuous, uh, you know, continuous generation of uh, 
supervillain gas. So individual particles are going through this phase very quickly, but there are many particles. I think that's correct. Yeah. I mean, it's always there. I mean, it's always, I mean, it's getting over, but it is basically replenished by other set of infalling gas. So at any moment, you are passing a, a sight line uh, through a particular line of sight, then basically you are catching those gas. I mean, I mean, if, I mean, not a maybe, like those gas maybe immediately, if let's say at T equal to T1, you are detecting a supervirial phase, maybe T equal to T2, you won't detect the same supervirial phase, but there is some other set of gas is actually in falling and you are detecting those gas. So that's what and it's anyway, a very small, very factor. small fraction, yes. And we can see this story in even this no feedback and uh, fast midway low and fast midway high case. And that actually explains the fact as well that in the no feedback case also we are seeing this amount of gas because for no feedback also it is infalling. The gas impulse is not basically, uh, which is not basically restricted by the no feedback case as well. So then the question uh, I think would be that why some, so these red lines are basically some super, some virial gas, which are also in falling. So, but they are remaining in the virial use. So then now the question is why some of the virial gas is heated up to super virial and some of them are not. So then if you dive down into the uh, theta, theta means basically the angle with the rotation axis of the galaxy, then you can see the dash lines are the virial phase, which are basically remaining virial, and the solid lines are the phase which are infalling, but they are heated up. So you can say a sphere of coordination with the initial uh, rotation, uh, initial angle with the rotation axis. As you can see, the things which become super virial are close to the rotation axis, and things which are remaining virial are kind of in the uh, like farther away from the rotation axis. So what <coughs> basically the gas which are falling uh, very close to rotation axis will heat up to the super virial, but the gas which are infalling uh, away from the rotation axis will retaining their temperature as a virial gas. And why is this so? Because in the place of rotation axis and near the rotation axis, the gas density is little low because of the heroic rotation. And because the gas density is low, low, so the cooling is low because the gas density is uh, low. low. And then also the compressive heating is also very low. Uh, compressive heating is high because compressive heating is like proportional to one by two. So two effects are actually playing role. One is the density is low and for the density is low, there is the cooling is low, but the compressive heating is high. So that is why, because the gas which are in falling uh, I mean, near the rotation axis are getting uh, heated up to super virial and which are like farther away from the rotation axis are cooled down like faster and they're not basically compressively heated that much as the gas comparing to like close to the rotation axis. So, Madam, you, so you spoke about this spike as uh, the, the flow geometry changing from spherical to disk. Yeah. So, that so that thing happens in every of these cases? Yes, yes, yes. But then going far away from the rotation, rotation axis, axis while staying stay close to the rotation, rotation axis, axis does it have any effect on how fast this transition can happen between the spherical, spherical. flow to a uh, disky field? No, I think the time scale is pretty similar. Yeah. We, we saw that. But the main difference is cooling, basically. Cooling and compressing so, heating is much more so in it's the more to do with the density, density of gas, rather than, rather than the, the rotation. Yeah. And I mean this mechanism is happening for the every gas, but every infalling gas, but it's more near the rotation axis. So and then after that, this is the final thing that we are actually all going into the disk. So so the I have talked about a lot of things. So the take home points basically from the talk is uh is First of all, that CGM has a lot of different phases. There is, I have talked about two of those phases. One is cool phase and one is hot phase. I mean, hot 
not hot, super medium wave. And then uh, for the full phase, what we had uh, see that we had seen that the satellite galaxies can actually give rise to this cold gas uh, in the CGM, in the outer CGM. Uh, and uh, not only by stripping, but also by inducing cooling in the mixing layer of this stripped cold gas and similar amount. Uh, and second point is, this cosmic, if we have cosmic ray in the galaxy, then this cosmic ray can give rise to like bigger and less dense cold gas. And uh, number three point is the super medial gas is in the extra planet disk and they're coming from the infalling medial gas near the rotation axis due to the lower density near the rotation axis. So these are like three main points I would like to like convey. Okay, so there are many questions during the talk, but if you have any further questions, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Okay, so my question is that you talked about in including cosmic rays in the simulation. So, and as you said that they can give rise to bigger folders. So my question is, and you probably mentioned it during the talk, that so you previously in the no cosmic ray case, the Cold gas due to temperature stripping, 